Section twelve of Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Libera, translated by Robert Southey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book one, chapters thirty through thirty three of Amadis of Gaul. Chapter thirty: How King Lisuarte held a Cortes and of what happened there. King Lisuarte was so content with the tidings of Amadis and Galior, which the dwarf had brought him that he determined to hold the most honourable court that ever had been held in Great Britain. At this time, Olivas made his appeal of treason against the Duke of Bristol for the death of his cousin, and the king, with the advice of those who were best versed in these forms, summoned the duke to answer within a month, and if he would justify his cause with two knights beside himself, Olivas should produce the other two, their equals, to maintain his accusation. This done, the court was proclaimed for the day of Our Lady in September. One day, when they were all assembled in the palace, and devising together of the festival, a strange damsel, well attired and accompanied by a gentle page, entered and dismounted from her palfrey, and asked which was the king. Lazuade answered, He was the man. In sooth, my lord, she replied, you seem like a king in your port and countenance, but I know not whether you be so in your heart. Damsel, quoth he, you see the one, and shall be satisfied when you prove the other. She answered, you speak as I desire. Remember, therefore, what you have promised before so many great persons. For when you hold your court in London, on St. Mary's Day, I shall put you to the proof. So took she leave of him, returning the way she came. All present were much troubled at the rash promise which he had made to a strange damsel, knowing that for no fear would he leave to perform it, and doubting that some ill was designed him. Presently three knights came through the gate, two of them armed at all points, the third unarmed, and of good stature and well proportioned, his hair grey, but of a green and comely old age. He held in his hand a coffer, and having inquired which was the king, dismounted from his palfrey and knelt before him, saying, God preserve you, sir, for you have made the noblest promise that ever king did, if you hold it. What promise was that? quoth Lisuarte. To maintain chivalry in its highest honour and degree, few princes nowadays labour to that end. Therefore, are you to be commended above all other? Certes, knight, that promise shall I hold while I live. God grant you life to complete it, quoth the old man, and because you have summoned a great court to London, I have brought something here which becomes such a person for such an occasion. Then he opened the coffer and took out a crown of gold, so curiously wrought and set with pearls and gems, that all were amazed at its beauty, and it well appeared that it was only fit for the brow of some mighty lord. Is it not a work which the most cunning artists would wonder at? said the old knight. Lisuarte answered, In truth it is. Yet, said the knight, it hath a virtue more to be esteemed than its rare work and riches. Whatever king hath it on his head shall always increase his honour. This it did for him for whom it was made till the day of his death. Since then no king hath worn it. I will give it to you, sir, for one boon, which will save my head that is now in danger to be lost. The queen, hearing this, exclaimed, Truly, my lord, such a jewel well becomes you. Give anything for it that the knight may ask. You also, lady, said the knight, should purchase a rich mantle that I bring. And he took from the coffer the richest and most beautiful mantle that ever was seen. For besides the pearls and precious stones wherewith it was beautified, there was figured upon it all the birds and beasts in nature, so that it looked like a miracle. On my faith! exclaimed the queen. This cloth can only have been made by that lord who can do everything. It is the work of man, said the old knight, but rarely will one be found to make its fellow. It should belong to a wife rather than maiden, for she that weareth it shall never have dispute with her husband. Resena answered, If that be true, it is above all price. I will give you for it whatever you ask. And Lisuarte bade him demand what he would for the mantle and the crown. The old man answered, I must go to my sorrow, to him whose prisoner I am, and have now no time to stay, nor to consider what their worth should be. But I will be with you at your court in London. Till then, keep you the crown, and you, my lady, the mantle. If you do not accept my terms, you shall restore them. But having proved their virtue, you will be ready to pay me more than now, was what I replied. We will either give you what you ask, or restore the crown and mantle. Knights and ladies all, quoth the old man. You hear what the king and queen promise, that they will restore to me my crown and mantle, or give me what I shall ask. 
They answered, We all hear. The old man then took his leave, saying, I go to the worst prison that ever man made. One of the armed knights took off his helmet while he was there, and appeared young and sufficiently comely. The other would not unhelm himself, but held down his head, and he was of such over-great stature that no knight in the court could equal him by a foot. So they three departed, and the crown and mantle were left with the king. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 How Amadis and Don Galior and Bailes of Casartin and Bailes of Casarte arrived at the palace of King Lisuare, and Galior remained as the king's knight. Amadis, Galior, and Bailes continued their course till they reached the house of King Lisuarte, and so great was the general desire to see them that scarcely could they make their way through the thronged streets or into the palace. They were soon disarmed, and when the two brethren were seen, how fair they were, and of what young years, all who beheld them cursed Archelaus for the heart he had to devise their deaths. Forthwith the king led them to Brisena's chamber, when Amadis passed the door and held Oriana, his heart leaped, and she who, albeit the tidings of his safety had reached her, still feared he was dead because of her exceeding love, could not now refrain from tears, and lingered behind her mother to control that passionate feeling. But Amadis, taking his brother by the hand, knelt before Brisena and said, "'Here, lady, is the knight whom you bade me seek.' She answered, "'And he is right welcome,' and then embraced the brethren." Madam, quoth Lisuare, you should divide them with me. As Amadis is your knight, give me Galior for mine. She answered, Never yet was so great a boon granted in Britain, but you deserve it, being the noblest of all her kings. What say you, Sir Galior, will you be the king's knight? Galior replied, Methinks whatever so great a king demandeth should be granted. You have me here to obey you in this and every other respect, so far as it be with the will of my lord and brother Amadis, for I will do nothing against his command. I am well pleased, quoth she, that you will obey him, for he is mine. I beseech you, brother, then, said Amadis, do what the queen desires. And Galior then bade her dispose of him as she would. My lord, quoth she, I give you Don Galior, and I beseech you love him as he deserves. The king then seated himself by Brisena, and they talked with Galior. Mabilia, who was apart with Oriana and Olinda, because they three were the noblest damsels, seeing Amadis with Agriez, called to her brother, and bade him bring that knight nearer, for they greatly desired to see him. They then came up, and she knowing what remedies their hearts required, placed Agriez beside Olinda and Amadis by Oriana, and being herself in the middle, said, Now I am between the four persons in the world whom I love best. When Amadis saw himself near his lady, his heart leapt. She welcomed him, and putting out her hands between the lace of her mantle, took his hands and pressed them, as if she would have embraced him, and said, My friend, what agony that traitor made me endure! Never was woman in such danger, and certes, never with such reason. For never had any one so great a loss as I should suffer in losing you. For as I am better beloved than all others, so is it my good fortune to be beloved by him who excels all others." Amadis, who heard himself thus praised, could make no reply, for so beautiful did she appear that the words died upon his lips. But she, whose eyes were fixed upon him, said, Dear friend, how should I not love you above all others? For all love and esteem you, and you love me. Reason it is, then, that better than all others I should love you. Lady, then replied Amadis, I beseech you rather pity the death which I daily endure for your sake. That which they told you had befallen me, would be my consolation and rest. Were it not for the strong desire my heart has to serve you, that heart could not resist its sorrows, but would sink under them. Not that I fail to confess that one thought from you repays my pain, but something more is required, and without which it will soon bring me to my end. And then the tears started in his eyes. Dear friend, said Oriana, for God's sake, talk not of your death. It makes my heart sink, for I could not live an hour after you, and only desire to live for you. What you say I will believe, loving as much as you do, and that come what will, I promise you, that if fortune offers us no means of rest, my weak courage shall find one, though the displeasure of my father and mother should follow, which would be more endurable than these fears and this suspense. Amadis could not answer, but he sighed from his heart. She took his hand. Friend, I will perform this promise. Meantime, do not quit the court. At this time the queen called Amadis, and made him sit near Galior. 
the dames and damsels of the court meantime talked only of the two brethren how god had made them as surpassing in beauty as in deeds of arms and all goodness they thought galior of the fairer complexion but amadis had crisp auburn locks and more colour in his face and was the larger limbed when the tables were ready amadis and galior were placed at one table by the king's command with gavlis lackland and agriez and no others and as these four knights had sat at the same board so afterwards did they partake of many the same dangers and although don galvanese was akin to none of them except agriez yet amadis and galior always called him uncle and he called them his nephews whereby his honour was afterwards greatly increased End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two how king lisuarte ordained his cortes to be held in london as it had pleased god to make lisuarte of a prince who had no heritage king of great britain and to give him the greatest glory and prosperity that man could wish so now lest his heart should wax proud and be corrupted his peace was to be disturbed he sent forth his summons to hold the court on the fifth day at london a city which then was like an eagle above all the rest of christendom that they might take order for the advancement of chivalry but there where he thought all the world would yield him obeisance began the first change of fortune and his kingdom and person were put in danger of utter ruin king lisuarte with all his chivalry departed from windsor to the court and the queen with all her dames and damsels the assembly was wonderfully great young kings costly armed and adorned and infantas who were the king's daughters and damsels of high degree for whom their lovers were about to make pastime and pleasure that they might not lodge in the city the king ordered pavilions to be pitched in the plain by the brooks and fountains that abound in that land here led they the happiest life that could be imagined to this court there came a great lord more noble in estate and rank than in the dignity of virtue barsanan lord of sansuena not that he was vassal or friend to king lisuarte nor even known to him but for this cause he being in his own land archelaus the enchanter came to him and said lord barsanan if you like it i will so contrive that with great difficulty or labour you shall become king of great britain barsanan answered i should gladly undergo any labour or difficulty for such a reward promise then to make me chief of your household for life and the thing shall be done that will i write willingly but how shall it be done in this manner quoth archelaus go you with a good company of knights to the first court that king lisuarte shall hold i will contrive to carry away the king prisoner so that no person shall be able to succour him and at the same time i will give you his daughter oriana to wife in five days time i will send lisuarte's head to london then do you having the heiress to the throne in your power take the occasion and seize the crown with this design came barsanan to the court where he was honourably entertained and, and albeit his heart failed him and he almost repented of the enterprise seeing the great power of knighthood that was with lisuarte yet determined he to abide the end but lisuarte nothing misdoubting him to do him the greater honour gave him his own palace and pitched tents for himself and for the queen in the fields and consulted with him upon the business of that court how he might best advance chivalry to this effect the next day was appointed for council when morning came the king clad himself in royal robes befitting the solemnity and sent for the crown which the old knight had left him and desired the queen to attire herself in the mantle she opened the coffer wherein they were laid with the key which she always kept herself and found nothing therein whereat she was greatly amazed and crossed herself and sent to inform the king he albeit he was much troubled dissembled his chagrin and going to the queen took her apart and said how madam have you kept so ill a thing of such value sir she replied i know not what to say the coffer was locked and the key which i have never trusted from me in my own possession but i dreamt last night that a damsel came and asked me to show her the coffer which in my sleep i did and she demanded the key and i gave it to her and she opened the coffer and took out the crown and mantle then fastened it again and replaced the key and she clad herself in the mantle and put on the crown which so well became her that i had great delight in looking at her and she said to me he and she whose these shall be before five days end shall reign in the realm of the mighty one who now labours to defend it and to conquer the lands of others i asked her of whom she spake she answered you will know at that time and then she vanished taking with her the crown and mantle but i know not whether this happened to me in a dream or in very deed at this the king marvelled greatly and charged her that she should tell no one 
Then leaving that tent they both went to the other, accompanied by so many knights and dames and damsels, that all who saw them wondered. The king seated himself upon a rich seat, and the queen sat on another somewhat below him, both of which were placed upon carpets of cloth of gold. The knights ranged themselves on the king's side, and the ladies on the side of the queen. The four knights, whom the king most esteemed, were nearest him, Amadis, Galior, Galvanes, and Agrias. At his back was King Arban of North Wales, armed at all points, and holding a drawn sword, and with him were two hundred knights. In this order, all being silent, there stood up a lady, exceedingly fair and richly garmented, and there arose with her at the same time twelve dames and damsels, attired with like bravery and the same adornments. For this custom had the ladies and chiefs of high degree, to take with them to such solemnities their followers, apparelled like their own proper persons. This lady, with this attendant, stood up, before the king and queen, and addressing Lizuare, she said, "'Sire, hear me. I have a claim against this knight,' stretching forth her hands towards Amadis. She continued, and related how Angriot of Estravaz had sought her love, and why he kept the veil of pines, and how Amadis, having forced the pass, had promised to procure for him his mistress's favour. "'Whereof,' quoth she, "'when I attained knowledge, I withdrew myself to my castle, where I kept such a strong guard and custom, that it was thought no strange knight could enter. Nevertheless this knight entered, who was at your feet,' pointing to Amadis, whom she knew not. He afterward of his good will promised to make Amadis revoke his word to Angriot, but then there chanced a combat between him and mine uncle Garcinet and all eyes were fixed upon Garcinin, while she related how the battle had been, marvelling that he should have dared to do battle with Amadis. "'And here, sir,' said she, "'am I come to claim his promise and discharge my own?' When she had ended, Amadis arose and said, "'What the lady hath said is true, and I promise to make Amadis revoke his word to Angriot. Let her also grant the coveted boon.' Thereat in great joy she exclaimed, "'Ask what you will.' "'What I demand is,' quoth he, that you marry Angriot, and love him even as he loveth you. Holy Mary, help me, she exclaimed, what is this? Fair lady, replied he, it is that you should wed a knight deserving one of your birth and beauty. But your promise? It is performed, I revoke my word to Angriot, for I am Amadis, but I claim the performance of yours, so give I you to him, and keep my faith with both. Sir, quoth she to the king, is this Amadis indeed? without a doubt. Ah, wretch, she cried, it is vain for mortal man to avoid what God hath decreed. It was for no dislike nor misesteem that I refused Sir Angriot, but because being free I would have preserved my single liberty, and now, when I thought myself safely separated, I am thus put in his power. Then said Lisuare, as God shall help me, fair lady, you have great reason to rejoice, for as you are fair and of high degree, so is he young and of great prowess, and as you are rich in possessions, so is he in all goodness. Great reason is there then in such a marriage, and so it must appear to all. Grovenessa turned to the queen. You, my lady queen, whom God had made one of the best and wisest princesses in the world, what do you say to me? That Angriot deserves the love of any lady. Trust me, quoth Amadis, my promise to Angriot was made neither by chance, nor for any undue favour to him but because having to my danger proved his worth in arms, I felt myself bound to remedy as far as I could his extreme passion for you, and your little regard towards him. I must yield, quoth Grovenessa, and after all that has been said, it were folly not to be well pleased. Sir Angriot, quoth Amadis, here is your lady. I perform my word on condition that the marriage be performed without delay. The king commanded the bishop of Salerno to go with them to his chapel, and give them the blessings of the church. Forthwith Angriot and his bride, with all their lineage, went into the city, and there was the marriage ceremony, with all solemnity, performed, and we may say that all this had been so ordered to requite Angriot for his great courtesy and forbearance towards this lady when he had her in his power. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 How when the Cortes was assembled, King Lizuare asked counsel of his knights concerning what he ought to do. King Lizuare, remaining with his chiefs, thus bespake them, Friends, since God hath made me more rich in dominion and in subjects than any of the kings my neighbours, reason it is that for his service I should perform more praiseworthy things than they. Tell me then how I may best promote my honour and advancement together with your own, and what shall seem best that will I do. Then Barsanen, lord of Sansuena, arose and said, 
"'You have heard, sirs, the king's charge. "'I should hold it good that if he pleased he would leave ye, "'that ye might the more freely deliver each his opinion, "'and afterwards he may follow that which most accords with his own.' "'The king replied that he said well, "'and therewith departed into another tent. "'Then Sarilas the Fleming, who was Count of Clara, "'began in this manner. "'Sirs, it is manifest that men in this world "'can only become powerful by strengthening themselves with men and money.' but the money should be employed in procuring men, for by men must kingdoms be defended and won. Other counsel than that, sirs, the king will not take, to seek good knights from all parts, and love and cherish and honour and reward them with his bounty, so that strangers shall seek him for the fame thereof. They alone have been fortunate and mighty, who have thus strengthened themselves with the aid of famous knights, distributing treasures to them, and acquiring by their aid greater treasures, the spoils of others. This advice was well liked of by all except Barsinan, whom it troubled, because if that were followed he should hardly effect the purpose for which he came. Certes, said he, I never saw many so good men yield so foolishly at a word. If your lord were to do as the Count of Clara hath proposed, before two years were at an end, the king would have given to strangers what else would have been given among you, and you would be neglected and of no account, while his favours would naturally be bestowed upon them being newly come. Look ye well to this, it concerns not me, only that I shall rejoice if my advice should be found profitable. Some there were envious and greedy men, who were of this mind, so that there arose a contention, and it was agreed that the king should come and decide. But he, seeing the things clearly before his eyes, said thus, Kings are powerful, not for the much, but for the many at their command. With his own person what can he do? Less, perhaps, than another man." Can he govern his estates with that? You can answer me. Can his treasures lighten him of that care? Not unless they are well expended. It is plain, then, that human wisdom and human strength are the real treasures. By this liberality have the noblest chiefs been made famous, the great Alexander, the mighty Julius Caesar, the haughty Hannibal. Good friends, therefore, not only do I think it best to seek the service of good knights, but I beseech you all to assist me in the search, and bring them to my court that I, being the more honoured in foreign parts, your honour may also be the greater. And be ye sure that I shall never forget old friends for new, and let me know the best who are come to my court, that we may have them in our company before they depart. This accordingly was done, and the king having the list, summoned them all before him after his meal, and besought them to enter loyally into his service, and not to quit his court without his permission, and he on his part promised to honour and reward them. To this all who were present agreed, excepting Amadis, for he was the queen's knight. This done, the queen requested them to hear her, for it pleased them she would speak. They all drew near her in silence, and she said to the king, Since you, my lord, have so favoured and honoured your knights, reasonable it is that I should do the like to my dames and damsels, for their sake to all others, wheresoever they be. Therefore I beg a boon of you, and of these good men, for in the festivals like these good boons ought to be asked and granted. Lazuade looked round his company. Friends, what answer shall we make the queen? They all answered, Grant her what she demand. What else, quoth Galior, but to obey so excellent a lady? Then said the king, Seeing you are all content, let the boon be granted. How weighty soever it may be to perform. And they all answered, So be it. The boon I ask is this, said Brisena, that ye always defend dames and damsels from all wrong. And if by chance you have made promise of two suits, one to a man, the other to a woman, you shall accomplish the woman's request first, as being the weakest person, and who hath most need to be helpen. Thus shall women travel more safely along the highways, and discourteous and cruel men shall fear to offer them force or injury. Greatly were Lizuade and all his knights contented with that request, and the king commanded that it should be observed, as it long was in Great Britain, never night breaking it but how it was at last broken is not to the purpose here to say. End of chapter 33